was. But this is a great way, and I think this has been tremendous to have digital media has actually brought us colder, uh, closer together. COVID times have made us closer to each other, at least in terms of, uh, of seeing each other far more frequently. So we're going to have these webcasts monthly, just for the audience to understand and for my colleagues. I'm welcoming everyone onto this webcast on behalf of the, behalf of the leadership of the Asia Pacific Society of Interventional Cardiology, on behalf of the board members of Asia Pacific Society of Interventional Cardiology, and monthly, we intend bringing the best of Asia Pacific and with the East meeting the West to exchange some of the knowledge, ideas, learnings from across the world. The best would be presented here. Without, with these words, let me just pass it on to my colleague and the past president of Asia Pacific Society of Interventional Cardiology, Professor Hoichi, to take the program forwards. Over to you, Professor. Thank you, Archuk. Uh we have deliberately uh, divided this session into two parts. The first part will be concentrating on coronary imaging, particularly with regard to optical coherence tomography, and the second part will be on coronary physiology. Now, for coronary imaging, we all know that it is particularly beneficial in high-risk uh, PCI as well as uh, complex lesions and uh, and. And I think uh, imaging uh, guided PCI has really gone uh, way up, at least particularly in Singapore, we are looking at about 30% of PCI being guided by some form of imaging. So for today's talk, uh, we're going to be uh, having uh, two speakers in the first session, and then that will also be supported by a number of panelists, which I'd like to introduce, Dr. Rajesh Mittal from uh, Dubai in UAE, Dr. Takashi Akasaka from Japan, Dr. Merit Alasna from Saudi Arabia, Dr. C. Baujak from New Zealand, and Dr. Ankuj Gupta from India. So uh, I shall go on and introduce our first speaker. So, so the first speaker is uh, Dr. Ziad Ali from New York. Uh, Dr. Ziad Ali, just a brief uh, introduction. He's well recognized across uh, the world. He well, graduated uh, from Sheffield in England. I think that's where he was born. He graduated from Sheffield. Some, some of his uh, seminal training was also in Oxford. He did his PhD from Oxford and then moved to the United States. His, his uh, earlier training was at Stanford. And uh, that's where he did his cardiology fellowship. I think he did his interventional fellowship in New York at Mount Sinai and then moved to Columbia. So at the moment, of course, he heads the translational medicine and imaging at the Columbia University and Presbyterian Hospital. He's actually tremendously, he's achieved tremendous uh, uh, expertise in many aspects of interventional cardiology, but certainly imaging has been uh, something he's taken forth to across the world. And it's just a pleasure to actually listen to many of his, his uh, seminal thought processes and seminal uh, pathways that he defined to make OCT a very important tool for our interventional practice in improving outcomes for the patients. With these words, I think over to you, Ziad. Thank you for being with us on the first APSIC webcast 2020. Thanks so much, uh, Ashok. Welcome uh, to New York. Um, and uh, for those kind words, I think uh, one thing that I've done over the years is uh, try very hard to make things practical for interventional cardiologists um, and not just about confidence intervals and curves. Um, at the end of the day, we're proceduralists, and what we need to do is learn how to do things step by step. And uh, that's what I'm hoping to do with you today. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you. And today what we're going to do is talk about something uh, that has been missing in the field, in my opinion, and that's an algorithmic approach to intravascular imaging guided PCI. But to get a truly uh, algorithm approach adopted, we need to make things simple. And uh, I titled my talk, Get MLD Max, which is something we all strive for, getting the maximum MLD uh, and using an algorithmic approach to OCT-guided PCI. So what better way to do this than with a case? This is a uh, typical case of mine, patient uh, with multivessel coronary artery disease, disease in the right coronary artery, a bifurcation in the circumflex, and the proximal left anterior descending. Um, as we would in any one of these situations in New York, we'd be um, 
we'd be pushed towards recording a syntax score, taking the patient off the table and counseling them on the risks and benefits of PCI versus cabbage. But in this situation, the patient elected to go undergo PCI given a intermediate syntax score. So uh, we've decided to perform an imaging guided PCI of the left anterior descending in this case. And much like we do now in the structural heart space, what we have decided to push towards is a pre-planned strategic intervention rather than an ad hoc intervention so that we're planning everything just like they do in TABR, what size valve, how long, how big, all of these things need to be taken into account. And uh, why should we not do this in the coronary artery if we can do it in the aorta? And so the way we've simplified OCT is to look at it in two phases, and that's pre-PCI and post-PCI, and use this term MLD max. So at the beginning of the PCI, we're going to be looking for morphology, length, and diameter, and in the post-PCI, medial dissection, apposition, and expansion. While I understand there's many other steps along this way, in particular, we focused on MLD Max because this is where there is a plethora of evidence to support uh, clinical outcome gain. And that's why we're going to focus on these areas. So let's just go right into it. Um, one of the questions that often comes up is, you know, how do you set this up? It takes too long. Well, what you're going to watch here is us setting up an OCT. On the bottom right corner is the instructions on the screen, and that's all you need to simply follow. After connecting the syringe and purging the catheter with whatever solution you plan to purge the artery with, whether it's saline, dextran, or contrast, it should be the same substance in and out. You basically go ahead and uh, drape your dock, pull it towards you, and then as the instructions say in the bottom right corner, connect the catheter. And this is uh, one of the simple reminders that every step that you need to take with the OCT guided PCI is written in simple plain English on your uh, on your screen. And then finally, we connect the catheter. Once we've connected the catheter, uh, a simple um, algorithm of how to remember which steps is to position the catheter distal to the lesion. That's fairly obvious, and then to purge the catheter lumen. And that is so that blood that's accumulated as we push the catheter forward is eliminated. And what you're going to see next after we enable the pullback here is a puff to evaluate the clearance. And if we get complete clearance, activation of the pullback mechanism in order to get an OCT pullback. Why did I record these? Because you can see that the uh, both the preparation and imaging itself took less than uh, 90 seconds. You have two pullback types on your OCT system, and I, I purposefully highlighted these, and the reason is um, of these two, you really want to set your system towards the survey mode or acquisition. Why? Because you get the longest amount of OCT pullback for the least amount of contrast, and the least amount of contrast is really dictated by the time for the pullback, which counterintuitively is shorter for the longer pullback. And the reason for that is because it skips every other frame and that while that uh, you may lose a little resolution, the resolution of OCT is exquisite enough that skipping every frame is still considerably better than intravascular ultrasound. When should you use high resolution? Well, you should first recognize you're going to miss two and a half, about 2.1 millimeters of uh, artery, 21 millimeters of artery. But it can be useful for recrossing a bifurcation. This is common practice in Japan. I know uh, Professor Akasaka has been involved in these uh, studies. Uh, and then second, it really, I think, practically is for stent fracture assessment, where skipping frames allows you to understand this on the 3D. More on this in a moment. So everyone should understand the user interface, just like you do on your iPhone. First of all, what we need to recognize is the angiographic co-registration is in the top left panel. The OCT cross-section is on the top right panel. And on the bottom are these two longitudinal features. What you'll see is this white dot, which is displayed on the angiographic co-registration, actually co-registers to the OCT cross-section, but also co-registers to the longitudinal pullback. 
One of the features of OCT, unlike IVUS, is that because the lumen is very dark and the wall is very bright, there's an easy delineation between lumen and wall, allowing the OCT to provide automatic measurements. And these automatic measurements are important. The reason is, as soon as measurements become uh, non-automatic, where you need manual measurement, very quickly our procedures become qualitative instead of quantitative. And I'm going to make an argument that quantitative is indeed important. Um, I want to focus on this thing called the lumen profile, which is this cartoon of the coronary artery. Essentially, this is a CT scan of the coronary artery that's squashing the three-dimensional structure of the coronary into 2D. So it's really taking into account all of the artery dimensions, but also uh, its eccentricity. Another feature to remember is that we have all of the uh, possibilities we do have with IVUS, such as making measurements of area, but this zoom out feature is particularly important. And that's uh, because for the first time, uh, we're able to measure OCT up to 10 millimeters. So now we're using OCT in the carotid and the superficial femoral arteries, but for the coronary operators on the call, clearly able to measure and uh, be applicable in the left main coronary artery. So uh, let's go ahead and get started with our procedure. It's 1230 in, uh, in the afternoon, uh, and we're going to focus on morphology, length, and diameter for our pre-PCI OCT. So let's start with morphology, and uh, no apologies for a quick reminder. As Ashok mentioned, I'm the director of translational medicine. I ran an NIH-funded vascular biology lab as um, uh, as a continuation of my PhD for many years. Um, this is the human right coronary artery. The innermost layer, which is this dark purple layer, is the intima. For you to sort of understand and conceptualize what the intima feels like, it feels um, somewhat like a, a hard rubber. Uh, it's uh, quite distendable. Uh, it's tough. It's um, sort of haphazardly organized. Inside of this uh, rubber layer is actually an elastic band. You can see the bends in the elastic band like you would use a rubber band at home. Uh, and this allows plasticity of the artery during systole and diastole. And then outside of this is the media. The media is a much softer structure than you may anticipate. And the best way to consider this is like a, a rope that you can easily uh, disarticulate, um, like pull apart. And this is why in CTO-PCI, we're able to transverse through the layers of the media very easily. Outside of that is another rubber band, the external elastic lamina, and then uh, the mesh, uh, which we call the adventitia. The reason uh, we uh, need to understand these different layers is because they are practically applicable in your OCT-guided PCI. You can see OCT allows a very easy assessment of each layer of the coronary artery. The innermost layer is the intima in bright orange. The darker black line, which is bounded by the red internal elastic lamina and green external elastic lamina, is the media, and outside of this area is the mesh. Why do I tell you these household items, and why is it important? Well, the reason is because it allows you to determine on each and every cross-section what the morphology is. If you can see the rope and that mesh in all quadrants or all 360 degrees of the artery, that artery is either normal or fibrous, and that deserves its own categorization because this is an excellent place to land your stent, proximally and distally. If you have fibrous artery uh, or normal, uh, safe land zones. Obscured, you have a pathology. And when that happens in the lumen and the light is absorbed, it's high attenuation, this is red thrombus. It's red because the OCT light is red. If something absorbs it, uh, you uh, obscure red thrombus. In the wall, if you have high attenuation, meaning an absorbance of that light, this is lipidic plaque. And if it's low attenuation, meaning the light is refracted in the wall, it's calcification. And if you're ever really not sure if something is calcium or um, white thrombus versus red and lipid, if you can draw a sharp outline around the signal change, even if it's just on the luminal surface, this is a low attenuation substance. 
So um, let's just spend a second on this concept of attenuation because I purposefully try to avoid physics terms in interventional cardiology. So let's do this thought experiment. Here's a flashlight, and we're shining this flashlight onto a bowling ball. If that bowling ball is black, all of the light will be attenuated behind the bowling ball, so you could not see it. This is the concept of high attenuation. On the contrary, if instead of having a black bowling ball, we have a crystal ball, and I'd like to know, uh, have that crystal ball so I could tell the future. Um, but you can see that light is attenuated in the situation. It hits the crystal ball and refracts. That's low attenuation. So when you have no attenuation at all, and you can see the flashlight hitting the artery, there's, this is either a normal artery or fibrous plaque. You can see the mesh all the way around the artery wall, and you can see uh, the rope, which is this darker black line. This is a normal artery. On the contrary, clearly this artery is not normal, and it has plaque. And one of the reasons I don't like to use the term plaque alone is because OCT allows you to determine the morphology of the plaque. This is clearly a bright orange signal that's a fibrous plaque, and you're able to see the external elastic lamina or media all the way around and the mesh, both excellent places to land your stent. But here what you'll notice is why you can uh, see the rope and the mesh from about 12 o'clock to 8 o'clock. From 8 to 12, there is indeed a signal attenuation. And we are shining our flashlight onto this bowling ball such that we can't see anything behind it. And this is a, a, a lipidic plaque. Conversely, here we've got our crystal ball in the wall. And what you can see is that light is hitting a substance in the wall and actually penetrating through it, but the light is being refracted. And if I took a pen, I could easily delineate this structure that looks like it's been punched out with a cookie cutter in the wall, and that is calcification. Of course, the simple way to remember that is that calcium is a crystal, so indeed it should allow the refraction of light. When you have the same situation in the lumen uh, and there's complete attenuation of light within the lumen, this is red thrombus. And when this is, there's no attenuation of light within the vessel wall, this is white thrombus. Why do you even need to know whether something is red or white thrombus? Because it does give you an idea of the chronicity of the thrombus itself. White thrombus is like toothpaste because it's covered with fibrin. So it's very difficult to manipulate pharmacologically and usually only responds uh, to a physical manipulation such as with stenting. Why does it matter what your lesion morphology is? Because indeed it, uh, it guides your lesion preparation. If you have a fibrotic lesion, it can be direct stented. If you have a lipidic lesion, uh, maybe a simple compliant balloon or direct stenting will be adequate. But once you start to identify morphology, of calcification, which is the main reason for doing a pre-PCI run for OCT, you start to quickly realize that there's very little difference angiographically between mild to moderate calcium and severe. However, on these cross-sections, you can clearly see how this may impact your stenting strategy. And as a result, we ask you to consider this when performing an imaging-guided PCI. So what's the influence of calcium on stent expansion? Well, if you have severe calcification, it impacts your stent expansion. This is a simple scoring system, and I truly take pride in the fact that we made this simple because no one can remember any scoring system except Chad's VASC in cardiology. This uh, scoring system is called the rule of fives. If you have a half a millimeter of thickness of calcification, if it covers 50% of the vessel arc and it's five millimeters long, the stent will not expand with simple techniques. And thus, at the minimum, high-pressure balloon dilatation followed by repeat imaging to assess for calcium fracture or, more preferably, atherectomy or intravascular lithotripsy uh, for vessel preparation uh, are guided by this technique. Here's an example of a patient with a calcium score of four. The calcium arc is more than arc is more than 50%. It's more than half a millimeter. You'll have to take my word for it. That's more than five millimeters. And what we do is perform atherectomy, which works in a wire bias manner to thin this calcium, ultimately getting it to less than half a millimeter, allowing it to be fractured by a balloon. And now you can see that these two areas of calcification are separated physically.
marked by the distal and proximal blue markers looking at this area of the coronary artery in exquisite detail. And by this is the angiogram and treating it as the angiogram and now ignoring the actual angiogram, we can see that this part of the artery is fat. That's somewhere we want to land our stent. But unlike on a conventional x-ray angiogram, here on the OCT angiogram, what we're do, able to do is look at the morphology of the artery to see if this is a good landing zone. And here we see all of the rope and all of the mesh and identify this is an excellent segment. We follow the same uh, process in the proximal vessel, looking for the fattest part of the OCT angiogram, and then checking to see whether or not this is a place we'd be willing to land our stent. Of course, what we should do is look for the best segment in the fattest part of the artery, even if it does not have a perfect 360 degrees of rope. Now, one thing we'll notice here is that the length is 35.2 millimeters, and we don't have 35.2 millimeter length. And so in order to perform precision PCI, what we need to do is adjust the more normal side of the artery so that we can come to a commercially available drug-eluting stent size. And in this situation, the distal vessel was the more normal of the two, and by moving in just 2.2 millimeters, we now arrive at a commercially available drug-eluting stent size and set ourselves up for precision PCI. So this is how to do OCT guided length in real life. You scroll into the artery and the lesion and then scroll out. You scroll into the artery and then out. And you'll notice me perusing the artery in this disease segment to find the best segment. And that best segment is defined by the maximum amount of EL. you also notice that this was a 35.2 millimeter lesion. And by pulling in from the more normal side at the distal, I'm actually coming to a commercially available drug-eluting stent size. When it comes to diameter, now what we've done is we're going to use an algorithm as we've already identified our reference segments in length. And what we're going to do is we're going to use the external elastic lamina-based measurements if we can see them in order to choose our stent size. And the way to do this is if we can make two external elastic lamina measurements, at least one quadrant apart at the distal reference, this is going to guide our stent sizing and our distal post dilation balloon sizing. If we can see the external elastic lamina, we're going to round down to the nearest stent size. If we cannot, because there's diffuse disease, such as this picture on the right, we're actually going to use the lumen and round up to the nearest stent and balloon size. In the proximal vessel, we make the same measurements and again, of how to make measurements. We've already identified our length, so the distal is locked. We're measuring EEL to EEL. This is 3.01 by 3.06. Very quickly, we know when we round down from the EEL, we're going to need a three millimeter stent and post dilation balloon. In the proximal reference, there is some disease, and for those of you who are comfortable to make an external elastic lamina measurement, you would make this at 4.36, understanding there's lipidic plaque, but also noticing that the OCT automatically determines the mean diameter. And thus, if we were using the mean diameter, we can also use that to determine our stent sizing. So let's recap at the distal reference. We measure 3.01 by 3.06. The mean is 3.04. We round down to our nearest stent and balloon size, so we need a three millimeter stent at the three millimeter post dilation balloon. Proximally, we actually can measure the external elastic lamina at 4.36, but I recognize that many of you may not be make comfortable making this measurement, in which situation we can use the lumen and round up. And you'll notice here that if we use the EL and round down, we ask for a four millimeter post dilation balloon, but if we use the uh, lumen and round up, we ask for a three and a half millimeter balloon. So this is the point of MLD Max, that we have, just like a TAVR, decided on all of our equipment to be in the room and next to us immediately. No running for equipment. We need a 30 by 33 millimeter drug eluting stent. 
our plan is to direct stent because there's very little uh, calcium in this artery, a 3O by 12 NC post dilation distally, and a 4O by 12 NC post dilation proximally. What's interesting about this is it took it me longer to talk to you about it than to do it. So this qu stu sort of study started at 1230. It's now 1243. We've already implanted the stent, and we're moving to the second part of this MLD max, which is looking for medial dissection, apposition, and expansion. A word on angiographic co-registration, which can be exquisitely helpful in making sure that you land your distal reference segment where you think you do. Uh, and we have proven in clinical trials that you can get this down to less than a millimeter by using angiographic co-registration. And so here what you can do is actually end up looking at the artery from the inside out and outside in, ensuring that you are indeed landing where you think you're landing, eliminating the possibility of geographic miss and as a result, uh, complications related to edge mislanding. How do you use this practically? I mentioned to you earlier on these blue markers. Here, these blue markers uh, actually mark the distal and proximal disease segment. Even if the lesion is long, we can divide this up and then guide our stent placement, as you can see here on the right side, compared to our co-registration on the, uh, the left side. You can do the same thing for the proximal stent, and this allows you to perform even long segments without any geographical miss. So uh, our post-PCI user interface is slightly different to our pre-PCI user interface. The first thing that you'll notice it is that there are a few features on the post-PCI which uh, it require specific mention. First of all is this uh, apposition indicator. This white bar tells you whether or not there is malapposition along the length of the vessel. If you have yellow coverage, that would mean there's malapposition between 200 to 300 microns. And if there's red uh, coloring, um, that would mean that there's malapposition of the proximal uh, of uh, 300 microns somewhere within the vessel. Clearly, there's a rendered stent placed within the coronary artery, which is done automatically uh, in the new OCT software. Other features of specific mention include the ability to look at 3D bifurcation. I'd like to pay uh, you to pay attention to these red dots, which highlight all of the branches which are more than 1.5 millimeters within the coronary artery. And what that allows you to do in 3D bifurcation mode is look at exquisite detail at features such as crossing uh, different cell sites, uh, um, looking at the uh, relationship between the stent landing zone and bifurcations, and we can do this also um, by uh, zooming out on a feature and looking at this segment uh, distally. Yeah, please don't um, uh, sort of um, uh, not use this uh, this feature to show your patients. Uh, showing your patients uh, the 3D coronary artery uh, arterioscopy is of major value um, to them psychologically. Uh, to show them that you've opened their blockage and show them uh, completely uh, what their reconstruction looks like uh, is of tremendous psychological value. Medial dissection, uh, I'd like to focus that there are, in fact, three sort of different types of dissections. Intimal dissections typically only impact the rubber part of the artery, which I mentioned before. And that's important because intimal dissections that do not reach the media or rope do not propagate. And as a result, they are extremely safe to leave alone. Uh, almost 99% of these heal within uh, nine months, most actually healing within a month. However, once you've torn the rubber and actually penetrated into the sort of soft rope part, we have the ability for blood to accumulate in the path of least resistance which may lead to an intramural hematoma. Thus, we recommend an additional drug-eluting stent, particularly if it's distal. If you have a dissection that's greater than one quadrant in arc from the center of the vessel and penetrates the medial layer, you'll notice for purposes of practicality, we've eliminated degrees and arcs other than simply one quadrant. Here's a, a nice way to look at dissections quickly. Once you turn on your post-PCI OCT, you'll see that it automatically identifies the two distal and proximal edges. And you can see that there is indeed an edge dissection proximally here, but it does not meet the criteria for treatment. And thus we move on quickly from dissection uh, um, assessment. 
What, what about apposition? First of all, I think we should define apposition in simple layman terms. If the stent is touching the artery wall, it is opposed. It's as simple as that. This is not expansion. It's basically a contact phenomena between the stent and the wall. And you should consider dilation with a semi-compliant balloon because you only need a soft balloon which can overgrow and not cause dissections um, to oppose the stent, which is very malleable to uh, any surface. Proximal malapposition that may interfere with rewiring or gross malapposition for long segments greater than three millimeters uh, should be considered uh, for treatment. Now, here's an example of malapposition that's automatically identified by OCT. This is a great feature. And it's automatically identified in three different areas, so even uh, the brightest among us can't miss it. Um, the, in the proximal segment, it's on the angiogram highlighted in red, on the cross-section highlighted in red, and indeed in the rendered stent highlighted in red. These do have consequences. If you leave proximal edge malapposition, you can see in this situation where the wire uh, following stenting was lost and re-entered behind a stent and post-dilation actually crushed the stent, uh, creating what looks like the beginning of a mini crush, unfortunately uh, not on purpose. Finally, uh, what about expansion? Uh, again, very important to define expansion. Here you have a stent which is completely fully opposed, see, by this white malapposition bar. But in order to be expanded, the stent needs to hold the lesion close to the normal reference segment. And here you can see the normal reference segment is actually larger than the stent. Thus, the stent is fully opposed but severely underexpanded. And this number here automatically highlights that the stent is 52% expanded. When should we consider post-dilation for correction of underexpansion? Certainly, if the minimal stent area is 80% of the mean reference lumen area, ideally we'd like to get to greater than 90%. There are two different modes of assessing expansion. We are moving towards the tapered reference rather than the dual reference. This can easily be selected in your settings. And the reason to select the tapered reference is it takes into account the natural vessel tapering of the artery at segments of bifurcation along the length of the artery wall. The display for automated expansion will automatically detect your region of interest. It will automatically determine your expansion. Uh, and thus, that allows you to act on segments of underexpansion using an algorithmic approach. As you can remember, in our pre-PCI, what we did is look for the external elastic lamina. If we can identify it, we should now remeasure it in our post-PCI. And if we can see the EL, we round down. If we cannot, we round up according to uh, our post-dilation uh, segments. Here, the distal reference now measures 3.28 by 3.26. You'll remember this was originally 3.01 by 3.06, and this is typical in approximately 40% of lesions where after stent placement, flow-mediated dilatation because of nitric oxide or simply because of opening the artery changes your balloon size. And so in this situation, a 3.25 millimeter balloon should be used to help to get to optimal expansion. And when we do this in a targeted approach, what we can do is see very quickly that we can correct that under expansion and move to 100% expanded stent. And thus we went through an MLD max guided approach looking in pre-PCI for morphology, length, and diameter, and post-PCI for medial dissection, apposition, and expansion. And we were able to do that in a similar amount of time where I was able to do this lecture. So this need not take uh, a long period of time. Thank you for uh, listening to this uh, algorithmic approach for OCT-guided PCI. Thank you very much, uh, Diat, for the uh, very systematic and easy to understand uh, MLD MAX approach. Now, given that this is going to be a practical uh, session, so um, I'm going to invite the panelists to ask questions, but perhaps I can start off with two very simple practical questions. First of all, it's the blood clearance issue. Uh, you mentioned about uh, using saline. Uh, I, I thought I heard uh, as, a, uh, as a replacement. So 
what media do you use? Uh, saline or or or, uh, or blood or uh, dextrin? And what mode of uh, uh, blood clearance do you propose? A manual clearance or is it a pressure injector? And the second question is, uh, how do you deliver, you know, because this uh, OCT has got a very short monorail tip sometimes in the negotiating around uh, <coughs> uh, ankylated lesions, there might be difficulties. So what are the tips and tricks of delivering this uh, OCT catheter across such lesions? Uh, thanks very much. Um, so good question. So first of all, with regards to flush media, I should mention a few things. First of all, no OCT study has identified uh, a decrement to uh, renal function by OCT guidance. In the Illumian 3 trial, uh, the IVIS guidance group and OCT guidance group actually had not significant differences in contrast between them or very slightly different. Um, between angiography and OCT, the difference is approximately 30 milliliters. It's never been shown in uh, patients with normal renal function to impact the clinical uh, outcome of uh, contrast nephropathy or need for renal replacement therapy. Uh, um, nonetheless, I wholeheartedly recognize that contrast is poison, and we want to give as little of it as we possibly can. And uh, we have recently published in Jack Imaging uh, the first report of uh, using OCT to guide um, uh, flushing. Um, and I think what we come away with is really two take-home messages. Now, in the right coronary artery, we've basically eliminated using contrast completely. We only perform saline-guided uh, um, clearance. And the way we do this is to use a 30-milliliter syringe, and at the time of our OCT, disconnect the TUI um, from the injector, whether it's the manifold on our side port on the TUI or your um, introducer port, and inject directly 30 mils of CC, uh, 30 cc's of CC's for clearance. Uh, there's problems with the pressure injectors for um, injecting uh, saline. Uh, many of them don't allow it. Uh, the second possibility is used to, uh, to use a manifold. But remember that the highest resistance within the entire system is that six centimeters or so in between your guide and your manifold. So that will limit the force by which you can inject, and that will create artifact within uh, the artery itself with regards um, to uh, image quality. In the left, I still prefer to use contrast, um, largely because uh, the imaging quality uh, is diminished by the multiple branches uh, and the fact that blood has a higher viscosity than saline. So we continue to use contrast. The only time I would change this is that you've gone up front with a guide extension catheter um, gentle guide extension catheter engagement of either the proximal circumflex, if you're imaging the circumflex or the LED, will give you exquisite images to the same level. We eliminated dextran use in our practice largely because, uh, as you know, um, we have a very large zero contrast PCI program, a specific referral center for this. And uh, we have noticed that dextran may induce a dextran nephropathy in patients with pre-existing chronic kidney disease, largely because it's high molecular weight or high osmolarity and requires injection of larger volume. Let's not forget that, indeed, uh, dextran is a plasma expander. Um, uh, with regards uh, to your um, second question, if you just quickly remind me, I can tackle that. Oh, how do you deliver uh, around uh, angulated and ultras lesions? Oh, right very now. good question. Well, well, um, uh, Tan, I think the the first way to to deal with the angulation is to uh, plead with the manufacturers to make give us a catheter that allows us to go around the corners, which we've done extensively, and uh, we are uh, very excited when Opstar becomes uh, available worldwide, which is much much better to to navigate these tortuous arteries. Um, uh, the second thing I would say I would say, you know, navigating a very difficult circumflex or a very angulated artery is indeed difficult and often required as a, a guide extension catheter. Um, one uh, simple trick is to sort of, rather than 
uh, going into the circumflex rather than pushing the guide so that it's facing upwards towards the left main to disengage it gently uh, to take out one curvature of this uh, will um, can be helpful. But again, I think Opstar is going to make a big deal. They've shortened the monorail so that it's more likely to take these bends uh, and stiffen the cash that are shaft to allow us to get around these bends. So can I just uh, ask uh, Ankush, Dr. Ankush recently presented an excellent uh, uh, paper at the PCR e-course on saline, uh, uh, saline injections for OCT. What were your findings, uh, Ankush? Can you just guide us on that? We can hear you. Uh, Dr. Ankush, did uh, you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, the excellent uh, presentation by Dr. Ziyad. Uh, so, uh, we also did a one uh, associated PCI study in which we used heparinized saline. Uh, we did around uh, around uh, 200 cases. And this was initially, it was a first uh, feasibility study in which we just wanted to see whether, what quality of slash, uh, lesions, whether we can... protocol two things we used heparinized saline and before each so we did uh, uh, we gave a uh, uh, intracoronary and and after this study now we these days we are doing a one comparative study in which we are doing head to head comparison with contrast and saline in which we are giving ntg and after this study now, we, these days we are doing a one comparative study in which we are doing head-to-head -head comparison with contrast and saline, in which we are giving NTG before each run. And to, uh, to our surprise, actually there is, uh, you know, uh, uh, there is no, not a linear relation with the saline and contrast. In fact, we, what we saw was with the saline, sometimes the dia of uh, the vessel is sometimes is more and sometimes is less, and that was not actually statistically significant. And as mentioned by Dr. Ziyad, in our study, we used the PTMC string, 30, 35 ml. And the best part of, you know, hand injection, there was some observation that uh, uh, why we didn't use uh, uh, injectors. The best part about the hand injection, initially when we started this, there was, a, you know, there was a, some <laughs> worrisome things that uh, you may encounter arrhythmia as you are forcing the saline into the coronaries. The best part of hand injection, it is under your control. And when you are giving uh, intracoronary saline, you, the only thing is you see the console, you see the screen, and the, the pressure and the volume is required as much as you get a clinically usable run. And uh, that is how we found that uh, even for the left coronary system, 15 to 18 ml, 18, 18 ml uh, normal saline is good enough. And for right coronary system, around 13 ml, average was 13 ml of heparinized saline. So the key is you look at the screen, OCT screen, you inject hand injection, you do hand injection, and you, uh, you see how much volume and, uh, you know, pressure is required to get a clinically usable one. Okay. So it was, uh, you know, uh, this comparative study is coming up. Uh, it will be published uh, recently. Let us see. That. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. We would like to have Dr. Mirbats and Dr. Uh, Akasaka's uh, comments on, on some of these. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Me? You can very hear you. Well. Thank you, Jia. The wonderful presentation from the, the basic uh, yeah, uh, uh, analysis uh, to the, the practical daily clinical practice. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I, for, I I would like to uh, 
emphasize one more、uh, important、uh, things for the beginner especially, right? The orientation of the vessel should be very important. Therefore,、uh, I always use a setting when you pull back a、uh, LAD, I try to put the CX in nine o'clock. At that time,、uh, uh, you, you,、uh, you can try to set、uh, the longitudinal lumen profile.、Uh, it depends on your,、uh, yes, preference, but、uh, if you、uh, put、uh, the CX upper side and then uh, the, uh, All the, the short <coughs> axis view from the, the CX side is、uh, coming on the upper side. That is、uh, the epicardial side. And then、uh, the, the bottom side is a、uh, myocardial side.、Uh, yes.、Uh, Angiocorregistration is very easy to understand the longitudinal orientation. But the sh- short axis orientation, it is very important、uh, for the beginner. And,、uh, because if there are、uh, eccentric、uh, calcium,、uh, we have to know which portion uh, it's in, uh, uh, the, the distribution, right? So when we pull back the CX, I always put、uh, the LED to the, the three o'clock. At that time, upper side of the short axis view is the epicardial side and the, the lower side is the myocardial side.、So、it is very easy to understand for the beginner. Uh, the, the, to understand the distribution of the, the plaque. Do you agree? Yeah, absolutely correct. Dr. Mara? Yes, thank you for the,、um, for the presentation. It was very thorough and、uh, everybody's comments.、Uh, I think what we're seeing lately is more t a k e of intracoronary imaging. Particularly as we tackle more complex interventions and particularly as we're learning a little bit more about entities such as MINOCA, which is, you know, MI with normal coronary arteries, and, and we can't depend anymore on just eyeballing flo-、uh, angiograms. And we need a little bit more detail. But my question to the experts who use OCT a little bit more than IVIS,、uh, I know our center, we're more IVIS dependent simply because it's habit and what we're used to and comfortable with、um, interpreting the images. Is for, for entities like SCAP, spontaneous coronary artery dissections, where there's some concern that we're going to propel the dissection more、uh, when we're injecting contrast and so on. And so, what are your, what's your experience on that?、Um, so, my personal opinion is that OCT is contraindicated in SCAD. You shouldn't use it.、Um, when you have another modality which was, does not require contrast injection, Or any injection, which is IVUS, it's the safer modality, and I think safety has to trump everything, even for a reduction in resolution. I was actually very vocal about this in the European consensus guidelines, where I thought it's sort of showing uh, the, the beautiful pictures,、um, uh, which may sacrifice even in a very small amount,、uh, patient safety is a bad idea.、Um, so that's, I don't perform OCT at all in spontaneous coronary dissection. If you recall,、um, as you know, spontaneous coronary dissection, there is no lipid. There is nothing to hold the artery together. You can unzip it with a guide injection. And so,、uh, for me, it, it's a no go. Okay. I think Thank you very should, much.、Uh, yeah. We should move so,、uh, I'd like to move on to the next speaker. So, may I introduce、uh, Dr. s i g n e y l o from、uh, Sydney, Australia, to talk to us about the relevance of OCT for ISR and calcified、uh, lesions. s i g n e y l o Stage. Right, I'm just going to share my screen. Let's have a look. Okay, can you see the screen okay? All right. So, thank you very much、uh, for the invitation. Is that on? Yeah. No,、uh, we, we can't see the screen. I'm up. It says I'm sharing. Is it not gone? Can you see? Okay. Is that there? Good? Okay. Wait, wait, wait. Thank you very much. Not yet. No? Not yet. It's, it's not yet. My screen's up. I'm not sure. Let me do that again. Stop sharing. s h a r e screen. Has I actually stopped sharing or not? You're all right, eh? Yes, you've stopped sharing. 
I'm sharing. It says, um, is it? Can you see? Let, let me see the support. No. We know we don't see it. So, no. oh, so, so uh, moment. No, sir. Uh, request you to share again. Uh, okay, let's stop again. And share again. We can just start sharing the screen. Is it sharing? No, sir. Says I'm sharing the screen. Hmm. Is it getting through? Um, no, still not seeing it. Hmm. Sorry about that. I don't know why. My computer says it's gone. So just the support you to can go on your computer. Disconnect and uh, reconnect again. You mean just sign out? Okay, let me just uh, let me just uh, do that. I gotta leave the meeting. Oh, don't worry. Don't worry about that. Science is more important and learning is more important. Oh, we have uh, PCC Jack there. Jack, we were missing you. I didn't, I didn't see your, your image till now. Uh, you're not missing much. <laughs> <laughs> So maybe um, while uh, Sydney's getting started, I, I'll just mention that, you know, really you can uh, use the MLD Max algorithm uh, in, in a variety of different lesion types. Uh, the same steps in bifurcations and long lesions and CTOs. Um, and it's uh, hopefully purposefully nimble in that direction. So, so let me ask you while, while Sydney's getting, you know, much of what we see could be done by artificial intelligence. Uh, this is, these pictures of OCT are so much, so mechanistic that artificial intelligence can pick up this action, will pick up the stent action, give us the stent length. Why do we need to do so many of these alterations ourselves? I mean, we could just press a button, get the lesion length, get exactly the diameters that we need. We could get everything just by pressing buttons rather than doing the measurements ourselves. Uh, can't it be made more simple? Can't it be more, more intuitively so simple that everybody should be using our OCT? Was it just artificial intelligence giving us the measurements and the final MLD max? So it looks like Sydney's got his presentation up that was oh. working. So I'll, I'll answer that question in just uh, uh, two words, Ashok. It's coming. <laughs> uh, it, okay. That's it. I mean, you, you're going to see it very, very soon. All ah, right. Okay. <laughs> yes. Sydney, okay. we had you for a second there. No, no worries. Is it is it on? Okay. No. It it was. Oh. What happened? So share it again. Is it up? We just saw it. I'm sharing it now. I'm not sure why it's not working. Can you see my screen? No. You want to sh unshare and share one more time? It's because we yeah. just okay. saw your screen a second ago. Yeah. Stop share. Do that again. So, Sydney, what I suggest is Again, log on, log off. We'll have, we could get back to you. We, we could actually, yeah. we could have the FFR talk because uh, sure. that would be fine. And then yes. we could get back to you. If you can email your slides to Delhi, they can put it from here and after the, after the th next talk. Yes, I've, uh, I don't know why, because uh, I seem to be, I'll do that. That's fine. I've logged on a couple of times already. It's a bit funny. Okay. Let me, uh, I'll email you the slides. So perhaps you have uh, Seko Tabello and uh, Chen Chao Yang to take over the uh, coronary physiology section. Hello.
Taoling Chen and, and, and Sengo Tuvelu, could you please take up the next session of coronary physiology? Yeah. So the next session uh, is going to be on uh, complex PCI with the use of RFR and FFR. And uh, now I think uh, we will ask uh, uh, to introduce the speaker. Uh, Shalin, can you please introduce the speaker? Can we hear Dr. Chen? Oh, thank you. Can you hear me? Very yes. well. Yeah, I'm sorry. I think there are some problems with my Wi-Fi. So I can. So I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry. I I feel there are some problems with my Wi-Fi. But I guess that probably I need to introduce the last speak, Dr. Ku, to present coronary physiology. Dr. Ku is my great friend. He has done many, many important clinical trials to emphasize the importance of coronary physiology for patients with coronary. So, Dr. Senku, can you introduce the panelists? Yeah, we have a very eminent panel. Uh, we have Tegu Sentosa from uh, Indonesia. Uh, we have Rajinikant from Brunei and Dr. Yu Cheng from Singapore, uh, Dr. Rosli from Malaysia, and uh, Dr. Zan Win from Malaysia, and uh, Dr. Fazila from Bangladesh. So we have an eminent panel, so we will have a discussion uh, after the talk. So we can go ahead with the talk. Okay, so that the good morning, good evening, maybe good afternoon, everybody. And I hope that I'll be successful in sharing my slides. So. Okay, so can you see my slides now? Yes, we do. Okay, so that the, I'll start my presentation. So I think the title is a little bit complicated yeah. because that the when I say physiology for complex PCI, because many of you will be skeptical. Some may think that the invasive physiology study is mainly for the intermediate or simple reason, and there can be no role or physiology for complex PCI. Or some may think that physiology itself is complex, so that the, there, therefore any physiology guided PCI is complicated and complex PCI, so that the, it was quite difficult to, to show you the cases how to use physiology for complex reasons. And having said that, I'll try my best to choose some of the complex reasons. Let me start with this case because my slides, my presentation title has a, a case-based learning. So the patient itself is quite complicated. 65-year-old gentleman had a bypass surgery 20 years ago. So that the, the surgical technique was quite uh, unique so that the patient had both lima and saphenous vein graft for LAD and the saphenous vein graft to the obtuse margin and uh, PDA. And that this lima graft to the LAD was included and the patient was well for the 20 years, but now the patient had a chest pain. So that the, what we did was the angio. So this is a native coronary left angio. You see there's some diffuse disease and blood competition here. And here is angio from saphenous vein graft, which uh, covers the LAD and obtuse margin. Flow is very nice. And the problem at this time the patient had was the saphenous vein graft to the right corner artery. So it's difficult to see here, but there was a very tight significant stenosis was there. So I thought that this is culprit for the patient's symptom. So after thrombectomy, stent was implanted so that the, I was happy and the patient was happy with that. And I didn't expect any further chest pain. But the problem was that the after having successful PCI in that right saphenous vein graft, the patient visited our patient clinic with the chest pain. I increased the medic medication, but unfortunately the patient still complained angina. So the practical question may be why the patient is suffering from angina after bypass surgery and stent implantation and how we can define it. So that the, I reviewed the angel for several times and discussed the patients and family and while looking at the angio, I found that the flow to the LAD was actually its dual supply from the anti-grade flow and retrograde flow. And I was a little bit curious about this territory because that the, it, 
looks like a very good flow, but there's a possibility that in this territory may have some problem. So the question is how we can assess and how we can define that this patient has some problem. You may use this angio and you can do the procedure, but what I wanted to do is a definite uh, evidence to show that it, this really matters. So that it, that's the reason why I put the pressure wire down to the septal. I rarely do the septal branch measure a septal branch FFR, but yeah, I think in this case, this is needed for this patient. So I measured the FFR and it was 0 0.64, which means that this big septal territory, there is a 36% uh, hyperion flow reduction despite the sapiens ring graph flow and anti-grade flow. So I thought that this is culprit. And what I did was that the rotablation and stent implantation here, you see that you can see now that this septa has become much, much bigger and the patient become happier. So that this is the uh, one of the case that I used the uh, pressure wire or the measure FFR for the complex lesions. You know this story very well that uh, there's a, a lot, you can see a to sometimes totally different world from different viewpoint. So this is a very old but famed study data when the patient of the angiographic 3 vessel disease were assessed by the pressure wire, they found that the true triple vessel disease defined by FFR 0 0.8 cutoff was only 14, 1.4%. And some patients, one out of 10, is zero vessel disease by physiology. And I would like to share one more cases about the using, defining the physiologic significance in case of multivessel multilesion by angiography. So relatively young female, stable angina, from the just keep when you just quick look at the angio, there's a just left main proximal AD, multiple circumflex disease and multiple right coronal artery disease. And from this angio, we may uh, define the patient as having a distal left main disease, triple vessel disease, and at least eight lesions. If you do IBUS OCT, you may find the uh, more lesions from this patient. So the practical question is what you can do with this patient and what will be your treatment strategy involving the distal left main proximal AD and proximal circumflex. So in this rather complicated scenario in our daily practice, if you measure FFR or physiology, you can find some different things. So that the, I tried to measure FFR in all three vessels and LAD FFR 0 0.80. So I was uh, quite reassured. And circumflex FFR 0 0.88. So it's nice. So that the LAD left main circumflex are all fine, at least from the physiologic point of view. And the, the question is why the patient has just pain and right coronary artery FFR 0 0.65, quite low. And the, the, the other task we should do is that the, how we can define the culprit for this uh, right coronary artery among these three different right coronary artery lesions so that the, when I did the hyperemia and pulling back the pressure wire and continuous recording the wi wire, I found that the, the biggest pressure step up occurred at the lesion number seven so that this should be the first target for the treatment and the stent was implanted and FFR we measured so it was 0 0.81 so that the, from this FFR Based story, I, the patient has been started from triple vessel disease, left main disease, eight lesions. We should be prepared for the very complicated PCI, or complex PCI, or the may, some may consider patient centered uh, surgery. But the, finally, in the end, the patient was coded as a physiologically one vessel disease and single lesion by FFR and fixed by one stent. And the patient become happy and the patient is still fine. So here's data from Asa Medical Center. You've been seeing this very well, that the using FFR in left main disease and triple vessel disease actually equalized the outcome in it, between the PCI and bypass surgery so that the using FFR can improve the patient outcome when you use routinely, regardless of complexity of the procedure. And I would like to briefly talk about the selection of treatment strategy. Here is the summary how your treatment strategy can be changed after physiologic assessment, either IFR and FFR. So in this uh, previous studies, it was found that the around from at least 20% and, and the highest around 45% treatment strategy can be changed if you measure FFR. So that the simple lesion, the complex lesion, if you measure FFR, 
it would be definitely helpful to define the corporate reason and to define the uh, uh, to select your uh, treatment strategy. And another very complicated scenario is that the how we can deal with the non corporate reason at the time of primary PCI. And there has been several studies, you know, these studies very well, and which consistently show that the FFR guided complete revascularization was better than leave it alone and in fact. Uh, couple of these only treatment strategies so that the, even at the time of whether a uh, complicated clinical scenario, uh, such as uh, acute myocardial infarction primary PCI, when you adapt the FFR or the physiology, you may do a better treatment for the patients. Another rather complex, complicated scenario is that the, uh, this kind of a, a complex anomaly case, so that the, this is the uh, IBUS angio and CT scan of the patient who have an anomalous right coronary artery from left sinus. So it is a bit the, a compressed between the pulmonary artery and the aorta so that some patient may have a syncope, chest pain, or and some may have a sudden cardiac arrest. But it is true that we don't know how to deal with this patient. So our routine is to do a dobutamine stress FFR measurement in this case so that this is whether uh, complex physiologic study. So this is the NGO after giving dobutamine, atropine, and adenosine. So that the, with this lots of stress test, still the FFR is 0 0.91. So that the uh, even though we need more data, we generally defer this patients and we don't uh, send the patient to the surgery and we don't implant stent in this case. And uh, this is our data of the 15 year follow up of those patients who had a uh, uh, FFR guided a dobutamine stress FFR and negative deferral, and the outcome was excellent. So that the in some rare complex anomaly, if you are good at physiology, I think you can uh, fix or solve the problem with the, even if physiology study is complex, but the treatment strategy can be simple. The other thing I'd like to focus on is that the risk stratification. So here is a case of the intermediate a left main osteal lesion, proxima LAD, intermediate mid LAD bifurcating segment, so that the if you measure the uh, syntax score only in LAD left main, I would say it's 22 or more. But you know that there's a, a concept of what we call the functional syntax score, which is that the the way to count only the lesion in the functionally significant vessel. So that if the LAD FFR is 0 0.72 or the 0 0.77, I would say this patient functional syntax score would be 22. So that which is a, a very important in, insight or information when you decide the treatment strategy for this patient. But when I measure FFR in this case, FFR was 0 0.82, which means that in this case, syntax score may be 22, but functional syntax score is zero so that this will be a totally different patient when the patient have uh, some disease in the circumflex or the right coronary artery. So we know that the, in, this is also data from the FAME study, so that applying this, the functional syntax score can discriminate the patient risk better than the angiography-derived uh, syntax score. And we, two years ago, we published the data to assess the value of the residual function, functional syntax score so residual functional syntax score is the syntax score measured after uh, a PCI or the stent implantation. So as you can see here, adding the residual function uh, syntax score can better discriminate the patient outcome comparison to the FFR and the residual syntax score as well. The other issue may be that the after complex stenting, we know that the, we shouldn't leave ischemia after PCI. So that the e, but the, the the next question is even the uh, post PCI FFR is high. There can be a several residual disease. So there will be the prognostic implication of these residual stenosis when you do a complex uh, or the uh, complicated PCI. So that here's the data that the even though there are several residual disease, there was a no prognostic implication of residual syntax score but the FFR value matters. So that the, even if after you do a complex PCI, measuring FFR or the IFR or the RFR will give you a better insight whether you have a residual ischemia or the 
the, your outcome will be, or the patient outcome will be good or not. So that this is another story. And I would like to briefly touch about the microvascular disease. Here is the case with the angina uh, exercise stress test positive, but the angiogram looks fine. FFR 0 0.89, but the IMR high 31, so that we can quote this patient having a microvascular disease and from our long-term follow-up study, the patients who have uh, overt microvascular disease, the outcome is far worse than the others. So that the, when you expand your knowledge of physiology from pressure to flow, you can better discriminate the patient outcome and select the uh, right patient for the right treatment. And having said that, I would like to briefly talk about the non high frame pressure ratio focusing on RFR. So previously, we had only one physiologic index, high parameter physiologic index FFR, so that the previous era was quite simple. But now we have uh, maybe too many physiologic indices, most were resting. So resting PDPA, DPR, DFR, IFR, RFR. And we can divide these, lead, uh, th these indices, such as a whole cycle pressure ratios and the diastolic pressure ratio, but the uh, most of you already know that the RFR or the resting full cycle ratio is a little unique. So this is a paper from Dr. Ali's uh, Euro intervention paper, which is a very uh, important paper for understanding the meaning of RFR. So RFR actually traces the, the instantaneous PDPA during whole cycle. So it, it can be either systole or the diastole, and they pick the lowest in instantaneous PDPA, and we can call it RFR. So that the RFR is not a diastolic index, even though most of the lowest value uh, hits the diastolic period, but it can be either systole or diastole, and that's the difference between the RFR and the other indices. When we analyze the the RFR data to see the value in comparison of the, the, the earliest resting index IFR or the FFR, here is the relationship between RFR versus IFR, and this is the relationship between RFR and FFR, so that the, there's some minor variations, but basically RFR is at almost equipoise to, with the IFR, and there is some discordance, and but the correlation is good with the FFR as well. And here's other DPR RFR relationship is exactly the same. So that the uh, uh, simply speaking, I would like to say that the most of the resting indexes may have the same value and same relationship with the hyperim index as well. And some may curious about the best cutoff, so that when you analyze the these resting index best cut off not from the FFR comparison, but from the PET data using relative perfusion defect and sodium uh, fluoride PET derived the CFR cut using cutoff of 2.0. It's very interesting that the RFR cutoff, this is not from the FFR comparison, but directly derived from PET data and cutoff is 0 0.89, so that we are happy using 0 0.89 cutoff for RFR as well to define the ischemia. So what would be the prognostic implication as a, a, a resting indices or as a binary variable? So I, I just mentioned that the RFR cutoff is 0 0.89. When we divide the patient outcome according to the RFR low, RFR high during two-year follow-up under medical treatment like FFR, low FFR medical treatment is much worse than the uh, high, uh, high RFR medical treatment, so that the RFR has a poor implication as a binary variable. And recently, we recently published a very long-term five-year outcome. This is FFR comparison, all medical treatment, high FFR, low FFR, and it's natural that the low FFR, the outcome is worse than the uh, high FFR. And what about the RFR? You can see the similar trend, so that the, there's some minor differences, but still having uh, low RFR medical treatment has a far worse outcome than the other counterpart when, to, when the patient is under medical treatment. But one interesting difference is that the sensitivity to disease burden. So here is a change of the uh, Resting PDPA, IFR, and FFR, and if I plot the RFR, it should be, it should follow the IFR value. And the, the, as the stenosis severity increases either by the angiographic stenosis severity or the 
or the physiologic standard severity either resting or either hyperemic value decreases. But if you see the slope of these indices, you can see that the FFR is more sensitive to the standard severity. And it's the same for the angiographic severity and IVUS defined lumen area, IVUS defined black burden, OCT lumen area, OCT percent diamond stenosis, area stenosis. So that the, in some cases, if you want a some sensitive index to define the disease burden, you should use a hyperemic index. Or, but the, if you just define whether the patient has ischemia or not, I think either would be fine, just uh, whatever you want to do. Finally, I will talk about this, some discordance. So here is the data of the two-year outcome data of the low hyperemic index or the low resting index PCI, so that the patient has the worst outcome. And this is a concordant high, so that the, let's say that if the patient have a high FFR, high RFR, so that the medical treatment. So here, uh, this is this black line is that the patient who has a discordance. So that the in two year follow up in our previous publication, we said that the, the discordant outcome patients was similar to the concordant normal. So that's the reason why in our previous paper, it's fine just to defer. But recently we published a five year outcome data and we saw that it's very interesting that the, this patient have a late catch up has a similar outcome to these patients have a worse outcome than the both negative. So that the now, in terms of five-year outcome, I would say that the previously, we said that they don't do PCI, just do medical treatment for the discordant cases. But now I can say that, I would say that the either PCI or medical treatment would be fine. But if you decide to do a PCI, you should do it very well. And if you choose a medical treatment, the careful follow-up and be prepared for the late catch-up. So this is my last slide. I would say that the coronary physiology is complex, but it can be and it is an essential element in understanding the patient disease status and clinical decision making and clinical application of the FFR and non hyperemic pressure ratio, RFR, and its extended concept can provide a better stratification and management for patients with uh, even complex coronary artery disease. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Koo, and it's an excellent talk. So now I want to initiate the panel discussion, uh, starting from Dr. Tegu and so on, all the panelists. So what is the view of using physiology for left main PCI? So we know that uh, uh, the PCI for left main is uh, very challenging, and we often have to use imaging. And uh, the physiology challenges are, one, if you have uh, multiple lesions in the downstream lesions, the LED and the circumflex, then assessing the FFR left main is challenging. And also, if you have a CTO of the right coronary artery, then also it is challenging to assess the FFR to the left main. And also, if you look at the RFR, currently there was a study published in Heart Lung Circulation a few months back that for using RFR for left main is sometimes be very erroneous and should be used very, very cautiously. So with that data, what is your view on using FFR or physiology for left main? Uh, I would want to have a panel discussion on this. Uh, can you start with Dr. Tegu Santosa, who does a lot of uh, left main PCI? Mm -hmm. to, be, to be honest, uh, I, I don't rely on uh, FFR uh, or physiological measurement for uh, left main because I find it is uh, cumbersome, uh, time consuming, and uh, I rely more on IFUS. Sometimes on uh, uh, OCT, if the lesion is distal, rather distal, uh, uh, involving the bifurcation, or if in the shaft, if uh, left main is uh, rather rather longish. But uh, I use FFR mainly if uh, uh, after uh, stenting, after stenting procedure, especially to assess the side branch lesions. But uh, for for uh, situation like you mentioned, of course. Uh, uh, it is helpful, but uh, for, uh, it is very much time-consuming. Time um, I, 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 yeah. I, I, I would also veer towards using IVS for uh, left-mean stem. 
The only point that uh, I will probably uh, use uh, an FFR with an IVERS in, uh, in left mean stem, when I see that the CSE is between 4.8 and 6, and in Asian, uh, there has been studies to show that if it's, uh, it's significant, if it's less than 4.8, but we also, also know that, that uh, the, in that data, uh, where Park's data showed that if you are using less than 4.8, then 20% of patients may actually develop uh, uh, events uh, later on. So in cases like this where I'm a bit unsure, I would then uh, tend to use FFR. Then uh, that would uh, decide uh, and we'll see whether the, the vessel is significant or otherwise. Dr. Rajinikant? Uh, I agree with the uh, previous two panelists. Uh, I tend, I used to do FFR even for osteo left man by equalizing in the iota and then going down, but these cases do it mostly imaging guided. There are times when I, uh, for the distal left man disease, uh, do do um, perform either IFR or FFR, but mostly if it's distal left main, I do OCT guided PCI, and if it's uh, OSCIM, then I would uh, use IVAS guided. So mostly imaging guided, and in situations like uh, the one you described uh, uh, with the RCA CTO on the left main uh, stenosis, obviously it's very tricky uh, measuring the FFR uh, if the uh, left system is giving collaterals to the right, and obviously from the practical point of view, I would treat the uh, CTO first, and uh, once the CTO is fixed, then I can go ahead and uh, do FFR if required on the um, left main. But, you know, like Dr. Rosley and uh, Dr. Santos, so I think mostly imaging guided for the left main these days. Dr. Yangchen? Yeah, I think, I think unfortunately we live in a practical world where um, money or cost is still quite um, important. So. You know, if you had to choose one, you probably err towards the side of imaging for the, for left mean because away from the diagnostic purposes of uh, uh, benefits of using IVUS, you can also use it to, to optimize your um, your treatment um, and your therapy. So if you if you only had the chance to choose one, I think imaging uh, is, is probably the way to go. So yeah, I I, I usually um, um, would use imaging or um, physiology. And Dr. Fazila, in Bangladesh, uh, we use often uh, imaging or physiology? Uh, well, uh, thank you. Great talks, both of them. Really enjoyed. And uh, our, in Bangladesh, as you are aware, most of our patients uh, pay from their pocket. So in our country, uh, we mostly use FFR in multivessel disease. And I found that this really works very well for our patients because it significantly cuts the cost for many patients. Like uh, previously, when we had thought that we might end up with three stents, once we do the physiology, maybe the price of one stent goes. So as uh, the previous speakers have said, uh, imaging would be my preferred modality for left main, but for multivessel disease, FFR definitely has a very important role, especially in a country like Bangladesh. Yeah, so uh, Dr. Zia, do you want to add anything for this uh, in, in left main situation? Yeah, I would say that um, the one caveat to do performing an imaging guided assessment uh, is that First of all, there may be differences in the body sizes, which may impact the sort of minimal lumen area role. We already know uh, data from Korea um, found a cutoff of 4.5 millimeters squared, but the conventional cutoff in the Western population has been 5.9 millimeters squared. Um, and, and, you know, I, I have to say, I understand Chi, Chi Yang, who, who was my fellow, uh, but if there's one place you've got to get this right, it's the left main. So if there's one pace where, where you can convince the patient, even in a payer situation where you might want to use both imaging and physiology, it's the left main. So let's think a little bit about how that's practical. Many times we do a provisional PCI, and the patient may end up getting stented in the circumflex for what is simply uh, a, a carina shift. I mean, BK has shown beautifully many times that uh, the bifurcation uh, physiological assessment will have more value than Im imaging guidance. So um, I'm a proponent in the left main of all places to uh, pull out all the stops. Uh, if you look at the Excel data, the five-year target vessel failure rates from the left main are staggeringly high. 
you know, in the order of one in four patients. So we're not doing as good as we can, and I think that liberal use of imaging and physiology in these high-stakes anatomy uh, really should be the norm. And uh, there are some concerns of using these uh, non-hyperemic indices, uh, particularly RFR in, in left main. I think recently it was published. So I think one should be cautious about it. Uh, yes, well, I so that the... I th I th okay, please go ahead. No, no, BK, please. You're better suited to... Uh, so that the, yes, it's, it's true. I think that's I think a uh, very important point because that the discordance between resting and and hyperemic indices is more frequent in the LAD, including left main. So that the, as Ziad said, I think that the, this is the place because that we are dealing with one of the most important lesion subset in corner RT. So that I think we should be ready to use the resting in this, hyperemic in this, and as well as imaging. So that my general approach is that to measure resting in this, hyperemic in this, so that if both are fine, forget about everything, just defer. But the, when some is, when there's a discordance, I do imaging because I, I fully agree that this is the, the most important place where the, both imaging and physiology matters. But the, if the patient have a, Right corner RT total occlusion, this the left main 90%. I don't want to use the physiology in the patient. Just go straight ahead with the image guided physiology. So that the, my general practice is that the, if the patient, even if it looks multivessel disease, but the stem severity is, is less than 70%, start with physiology. And when the patient need a PCI, finish the PCI with the imaging. So that's my general approach for the left main patient. If I can make just one comment on top of BK's about the left main. Remember, when you put your physiology wire down, whether you're doing IFR, DPR, RFR, pressing the button only takes a few seconds. And if it ends up being less than 0 0.80, there's no way your FFR is going to go up. Right? So you're done. Remember, you cover a huge amount of territory if your resting index is positive. But the reason there's a discordance, as BK mentioned, in the left main is because it's so easy to augment flow quickly. Where you get the maximum change in your flow is in the left main. It's got, it basically supplies the whole heart. So even small changes in physiology can make huge differences in gradient. And that's why um, your baseline uh, RFR may be negative, but your FFR may be positive. May I ask you all about the role of uh, QFR? Because uh, uh, Dr. Ko ha uh, hasn't mentioned about the role of QFR, and we know that uh, with this uh, resting index, uh, it makes uh, our life easier. It is uh, uh, not time consuming as FFR, especially if you are dealing with multifacial disease. Uh, it is uh, much, uh, it is safe, of course. Uh, we don't use uh, adenosine. Uh, and it is also uh, already validated in uh, many clinical studies, including Y52, Favor, Favor China, Europe, Japan, and so on. So, uh, how about the role of QFR, especially in uh, uh, multifacial disease? So, I, I, I like the concept of QFR because that will make our life much easier. But I think there's some something we should concern because that it's it's very dependent on the user's experience. If Dr. Akasaka is doing QFR, I would give 100% confidence. But if someone who is not experienced to the physiology do a QFR, I would give only 50% confidence. And the other important thing we should consider is the patient is already in the cath lab. So that the, I think we should be very careful it's not, it's totally different from the FFR CT or CT derived FFR, which is non invasive territory. So that the, I like the concept. And if we have a uh, favor three China, favor three Europe, Japan data, a clinical outcome data, we may have uh, more uh, support on PFR, but the, we should be uh, accustomed to the limitation of this. And the, we know that the QFR cannot be applied to the most of left main disease as well. So, Dr. so I just, I, Dr. Cook, I, I was going to ask you a question, and that relates to the side branches, the jailed side branches after a main vessel stent implantation, be it for a diagonal, be it for a circumflex, when left main is stented. 
And there's a lot of discussion about measuring, you know, understanding the significance of the jail branch by measuring uh, FFR downstream, crossing the strength and doing it into the side branch. But has that ever been correlated with any outcomes whatsoever? We seem to be applying the same physiology as of unjailed vessels or atherosclerotic vessels to jailed side branches. Is that uh, the way to go forwards or are we just over applying uh, uh, FAME data to side branches? Is there any outcome measures there? Yes, I think that's a very important question. So that the, I think it's, it's completely true that the jail branches is, is not a native disease because we already have some injury and geometry is totally different. And one thing I'd like to say is that the, we should focus on jail circumflex and, and the practical question or important question is whether we have a data on using FFR guided jail side branch intervention in left main. And we recently have a publication in Jack Intervention saying that the jailed circumflex FFR really matters in patient outcome. So that, the, but the case number isn't that big. So that the and there are several uh, fundamental issues related to use the, the physiology in the circumflex. But the, I think if the jailed circumflex FFR is 0.95, you're completely fine. But when it is 0.81, we should be very cautious about using the data because this is a different animal from the native circumflex disease. So that the, I don't want to say that the 0.81 is 100% confidence in applying to the circumflex data and maybe we need a more margin of the confidence interval in applying the physiology in that different animal than the native vessel. Can I, can I just ask one question? Because I've, I've got an issue with an, uh, a number of instances that I cannot explain. I find that in a number of cases of myocardial bridging, uh, and you have uh, you know multiple lesions, and you know when you pull back, uh, I, I find that the myocardial bridging actually results in a much lower uh, FFR, and sometimes uh, I'm concerned about how it affects the other reading as well. Do you have an explanation for this? So that the micro bicardial bridging is a, a, a kind of unique anomaly. So that the when you have a pressure down there, bridging happens, it will increase the systolic pressure. So that the if the same stenosis, if the patient have a myocardial bridging, actually FFR goes up because that there is an overshooting of the systole happen. So that the, that's so that the, I would say that the myocardial bridging physiology is different from the native coronary artery because that it happens on systolic comp uh, compression. So when we analyze the uh, FFR data and myocardial bridging and combining the dobutamine stress FFR, we found that the the best index to correlate with the diastolic FFR was that the residual diastolic stenosis severity, not the systolic, compre systolic compression. So that they had, for example, if the patient have a, when you use a frame by frame analysis, if the patient have a 100% complete occlusion of the systole, but that does not represent the presence of ischemia. But the, if the patient have end diastole residual stenosis 50%, the patient may have ischemia. So that it's a, a very complicated scenario. And the other very important thing is that the myocardial bridging, if the patient do exercise, bridging severity increases. So that the, in the cat lab, without stress, simple measurement of the resting hyperemic index, either if, either if we use a diastole FFR, it, it's not, it cannot be accurate. So that the, if I am very doubtful about that, I am doing the double term in stress FFR and picking only the diastolic comp uh, component of the, that value to estimate the functional significance, but it's rather a very complicated scenario. Can we just now go on to Sydney? Because I think we have uh, certainly had a great discussion on this, but we still need to have, the, have Sydney's talk, uh, which is covering a very important aspect of uh, ISR and uh, uncalcified lesions. So Sydney, ah, there we are. Is it up? <laughs> yes, it is on. 
Go on, sir. Right, I said this slides anyway. So, um, look, uh, I think we're going to be a little bit practical, and I really enjoy both the talks, so thank you for that. And uh, look, where, where we are, even in Australia, uh, imaging catheters cost money, but no one can debate that uh, stent failure, when you have either stent thrombosis or instant restenosis, uh, that imaging catheters are, are worth their while and can understand the mechanisms of failure. And particularly, uh, OCT has high resolution and better for imaging uh, what's actually happened in intima, and also seeing thrombus, as we saw from Zayed's talk, uh, and all, an ability to co reg easily uh, makes us very, uh, very good for us to actually understand what we're doing. Now, in the ultimate, ultimate trial, which was using IVUS, we know and we saw from MLD Max that uh, having plaque burden assess where your landing zones are, you can optimize the stent. Prevention is better than cure. The better you put the stent in initially, the better the outcomes. And if you image, size properly, expand properly, you can half or more reduce a target vessel failure rate at one year, as we've seen in the ultimate study. Of course, during the time of PCI, we're imaging and reducing the chance of restenosis, particularly reducing undersized stents, stent under expansion and stent malposition, which is the uh, max part of the MLD max algorithm. Now, in terms of instant restenosis, we grew up with angiograms. And this is Roxana's classification, focal or diffuse. And we know that if you have a, a focal restenosis, sometimes balloon angioplasty works very well, as in the old days, maybe even dilated it a couple of times before we had anything else. And, of course, if you've got a diffuse prolifer proliferative process or a stent occlusion extending more than five millimeters on either end of the stent, the pattern four they generally do very badly, and you have a very high rate of restenosis. And once you've had an instant restenosis, if the mechanism is really either drug failure for drug eluting stents, or actually the size of the stents are actually very good, then it's a very diffuse or aggressive NIH process, then they may not do very well, even whatever we do with them. Now, OCT has added a new dimension. We can see now what's going on in the stent. You can have a homogeneous intima or proliferation inside the stent, and that's commonly seen in bare metal stent uh, restenosis uh, when they've been in for a long time, for example, one to five years. We've seen some layer patterns, with, and, we, and because we've been able to get tissue out, we can correlate now what it looks like on the microscope and about what proteoglycans, uh, inflammatory cell infiltrates, and of course we can see neointimal uh, or neoatherosclerosis in some occasions. We see vessels on occasion that we can see with the OCT. Now, I've said maybe this will drive us to treat things a little bit more differently if you see a later appearance on the OCT versus a very uh, homogeneous appearance on the OCT. Now, I'm going to show a few cases. This is a 61-year-old man, an ex-smoker, high lipids, and a non-STEMI presentation. I hope you can see this. This is a uh, spider view, and the only lesion there in this angiogram was the osteo intermediate artery. Of course, the patient elected for a stent, this is a stent being implanted at the ostium of the ramus branch. It is a polymer-free um, stent with the platinum markers because it was an osteal stent procedure. And in fact, the operator wanted to do pacing, uh, something he learned from Tavi, and wanted to actually uh, slow it down so it would be less mobile. But you can see where the doll of the balloon is and a marker, and I think the stent protrudes into the polygon of confluence or in the distal left main. This is the final angiogram. I'll let that play a little bit. The pacing wire has been pulled back. So patient was very compliant. He's only taking aspirin, clopidogrel, and statin. But three weeks later, had chest pain. ECG didn't show too much, but troponin was definitely elevated. In fact, the managing cardiologist, and the patient lives about two hours from my hospital cath lab, brought him in and did a, a transferred him and did an angiogram. But both were not really cognizant of the fact the stent was protruding in a great way uh, in the left main. This is the angiogram. Three weeks later, looks okay. There's a little bit of slow flow in the circumflex artery, but the patient was largely uh, reassured. Medications were not changed, and the patient was discharged. Function of the LV on the left ventriculogram was very much preserved. However, six days later, the patient presents with severe chest pain, rang the paramedics. Thrombolysis was given by the ambulance as per the drip and ship protocol from a regional center. And he was transferred to a drip and ship. To a, and he had a cardiac arrest along the way in the ambulance, VFRS, most likely reperfusion arrhythmia. 
By the time he arrived, ECGs have settled and he was pain free. This is the angiogram. There's a little branch there on the uh, RAO cordal view, but it's patent. It's got good flow. So this is where imaging was done. This is the OCT. Might speed it up slightly for everybody. The stent in the ramus branch looks pretty reasonably uh, opposed. In fact, it looks pretty good. There's some healing going on, some coverage of stent struts. There's a bit of thrombus there at 12 o'clock. And you can see it's covered, covered. But as we hit the ostium, it's a little bit smaller in terms of lumen size. And you can see stent protruding about 7 millimeters into the left main in the polygon of confluence. Okay. So the utility of OCT in this particular case was one diagnosis, a definitive confirmation that the DES that's actually in contact with the vessel was well opposed. There's nothing much to do there. It, it confirms a thrombus on the stent struts, which were protruding into the left main. This clarifies the management protocol, so no further ballooning or stenting would be very helpful, so that was not done. Recanal rationalization of medications. Well, he was acute coronary syndrome, and he was changed to copidogrel from... Uh, copidogrel was changed to prasugrel, and some have debated about the Cagrelor. Actually, NOAC was at it for four weeks. Because there's now triple therapy for one month, uh, there was an opening declaration to the patient regarding the initial procedure, make sure he understood, and also explanation, he's more prone to bleeding for the first four weeks, and probably more prone to stent thrombosis again, because he's just had one. And as those stents are not retrievable, at this stage, there's nothing much else that's rational to do uh, in the procedure. That was the first case. The OCT and stent thrombosis, well, people have said that instant restenosis is of a spectrum. So stent failure, ISR, particularly late ISR, may actually be a lot of instant uh, restenosis occurring. And OCT is very good, as you can see in, in this slide from the Prestige Registry, looking at late stent thrombosis. And they've looked at many things. And what do you see? You see underexpanded stents, as in panel C. You see thrombus. You see uncovered or uh, uncovered stent struts or malopose stent struts. And you might see a uh, white thrombus. You might see areas of cavities or behind the stents, black holes. You might see very, very, very thickened um, homogeneous appearance, a lot of instant tissue, particularly ISR for uh, bare metal stents. And you may see neoatherosclerosis and new plaque rupture. So in the registry, they found that this is very common, stent under expansion. As we've also known, stent restenosis is also very common. Uncovered and malopose stent struts frequently observed, but that decreases with the longer the time interval between the stent implantation and the presentation with the acute coronary problem. In terms of acute or subacute stent thrombosis, we often see stent under expansion and or uncovered stent struts. But late stent thrombosis, we're seeing a lot more new atherosclerosis, particularly in drug-eluting stents and uncovered stent struts. I'm going to show a second case because we also talk a bit about calcium, 82-year-old lady with diabetes, actually on a pixaban for atrial fibrillation with severe angina. In fact, four weeks prior to this procedure, the patient had a right coronary artery stent, and on post-dilatation of a calcified right coronary artery, she had perforation and tamponade, but she recovered from this, and then she's come for an LED PCI. There's a heavily calcified LED lesion at the bifurcation of the LED, and so, actually, because the balloon didn't pass anyway, rotational atherectomy was performed. Six runs with a 1.5 millimeter burr was performed across this segment. And in fact, a cutting balloon was placed, a 2.5 wolferine was used to dilate this before the OCT run. This is the OCT. You see that not bad, the distal vessel, or mid to distal LED. You can see it, maybe a rotor signature, calcified, and some cracks. It's certainly been modified. Very small lumens. And then this is closer to the diagonal bifurcation with quite heavy calcification. Since we've seen some modification with rotational atherectomy as well as the cutting balloon, uh, a stent was sized on the OCT. 3O stent was, uh, was opened, a Zion's Alpine 3 by 18 However, you can see that on, a balloon uh, on stent expansion, this is not well expanded in the bifurcation. So we did, of course, what we normally would do. 
an, a 3.25 NC balloon taken to high uh, 24 atmospheres a few times, about four or five times. But you can see the waste in the uh, balloon. We had a, a wire in the diagonal in case we've lost that on dilatation. And then we actually got brave and got a 3.5 NC balloon, a shorter one, and went very high pressure, but still did not give. This is what it looks like on a clear scent. Still did not give. Uh, shockwave balloon was not available at this time in Australia last year. And you can see that we did an imaging run to see how big this really was. It's only two. And so this area is uh, significantly underexpanded. So we had the o OPN balloon, high pressure balloons on our shelf. So we took a 3010 at 30 atmospheres. And we did not give. So we went to 35. And notice that that actually uh, did stretch this area of stent about their 35 atmospheres now. So we test it without removing the balloon in case it was perforated. And this is the angiogram. And the only thing we would say is that it is better expanded, but there is a haziness around it, which is probably the calcium, but also very interesting. So this is the OCT, OCT run. The stent's better expanded across this area, but here is where uh, the stent actually penetrates more than the media. I think Zaid probably will have to comment on this in the discussion. There is a contained rupture in this segment of the, uh, of the LED stent about here. It's completely obliterated the, the architecture of the vessel. And this is what we've been doing on occasion, I think, uh, before we had shockwave balloons or before we imaged. We sort of got away with it. The patient had, uh, was discharged in a stable state but had some anxiety and chest pain about a month later with a repeat angiogram at another hospital, which I won't show you because it looks the same. And patient has been well for the last 12 months. And Zai's already showed you the calcium score, and I think OCT is quite seminal because, as, you, as he's told you, it's mining calcium because it allows that to go, uh, go through. The light source can go and image, and you can so see the thickness. And having those as a score, we know that we can, if you can balloon cross it, you can do shockwave, and, of course, check that you've actually modified plaque enough for a stent to be implanted. If the balloon doesn't cross, then a rotational atherectomy approach or orbital atherectomy approach would be very reasonable. And finally, a few more minutes, I'll show you my last case. This is a male who's only around 60, and uh, he actually, when he was a smoker about 15 years ago, had a non-STEMI and an LED bare metal stent. Three years later, he had more angina, but the LED stent was occluded. But the function was preserved because he had a good collateral. A drug eluding stent was placed across this whole segment, extending more distally. And he did very, very well up until last year. It's about 12 years of relatively good clinical state. And uh, he was in a hospital where it was, it was confirmed he had a distal LED. Distal part of the stent was restenosed and extended beyond the stent, uh, the LED stent. A cutting balloon was done. There was no imaging in this cath lab. And a Zion stent was placed, but it could not be dilated in the overlap, the proximal part of this new stent. And two OPN balloons was used, multiple inflations at 40 atmospheres, with three and a three five, but it could not be dilated. He returned three months later with some more angina and a repeat angiogram. So this is an area of overlap between a new drug gluing stent, another drug gluing stent, 12 years old, and a bare metal stent. This is the angiogram appearance. You see a moderate wasting around here on the LAO cranial view, and this is what it looks like with a balloon inflated. So he, this is the second procedure now. So IVUS was done. NC cutting, cutting balloon was tried again, although there's a stent there. OPN was tried again. Every time you inflate the OPN balloon, ST segments rise anteriorly. This is the clear stent. You can see compression of the stent from calcium. And this is the final result. A little bit better, but not that great. So unfortunately, he repeated again with more angina. This is the last procedure. And now we actually did an OCT run. And, and this is what it looks like. There's a new stent. And then there's a bit of overlap, some calcium behind stent now between the two layers. And then to more layers, maybe three layers of stent there now. You see 
coming to the narrowing, which is 2.4 millimeter squared. Quite eccentric calcium here on both sides of this. Quite heavily calcified instant restenosis. So now it's a shockwave balloon. All, all 80 pulses was delivered to this spot. This is what it looks like. Perhaps marginally better. So I put OPN balloon again, in again and dilated it one more time. This is the final result angiographically in the other view. And this is the final OCT image at that spot. It's a bit better. The lumen's about double, about 4.2. And this is the, this is the final run. I'll show you this very quickly. Around here is where the action is. Better expand its dent. So this is what an ivus looked like at the same time. And you can see that a lot of it's shadowed. Very hard to see too much. And so I think that for this sort of case, OCT definitely much more superior in the imaging. And these are kind of the before and after pictures. Although slightly better is not the most successful and uh, not the largest lumen you can achieve. And I will stop there and for, for a discussion because I think they were quite interesting cases. Thanks, Asha. Well, thank you very much, uh, Sydney. Uh, well, it's actually, been... many of these cases of uh, tent of failure that you just shared could really have been prevented if we started out with an uh, image guided at PCI, which would have gotten us all the information on the morphology of the lesions, isn't it? In fact, uh, IBUS has been shown to reduce mortality primarily because of a reduction in uh, stent thrombosis from all these uh, various causes. So, uh, Zia, can I just ask you, so uh, we, we don't have an OCT uh, outcome study at this point in time. Can we infer from the IBUS data that since Illumion 3 shows that OCT and IBUS uh, gives pretty much the same sort of uh, MSA and geographic as well as clinical outcomes, can we infer the, that the uh, OCT will give that sort of uh, outcome benefit that, uh, as IBUS would? Um, I think we can hypothesize and gently infer. I think that they're very similar technologies in the sense that they, the mechanisms of their reduction in clinical outcomes, as you just as quite astutely mentioned, is probably a reduction in mortality by stent thrombosis and a reduction in major adverse cardiovascular events by target vessel failure. And essentially, that's by putting in a larger stent and giving you a, a bigger minimal stent area. Uh, of course, that's why we're conducting Illumion 4. Um, those of you uh, who saw the recent one-year Illumion 3 clinical outcomes data, with the well-accepted caveat that uh, it was not powered for clinical endpoints, saw that uh, of the 450 patients, of course, there was no difference with an exquisitely low one-year event rate. Um, and and I, I uh, am uh, pleased that we decided to include a specifically complex patient population in Illumion 4 for two reasons. One, I think we have the IVIS studies that suggest that overall an imaging-guided strategy can be helpful, but I think what we need to prove uh, and is more practical that imaging guided PCI can be helpful in complex PCI because to be honest, like it or not, I don't see us using imaging in every case given the economic restrictions around the world. But if we can prove that it's particularly beneficial in complex PCIs, then it may be a more targeted audience for imaging use. So can I just ask so Saif, uh, Saif, uh, we haven't uh, uh, had a comments from you, but I would definitely like to have your comments and on understanding whether you, for your instant restenosis of a calcium, use uh, IVUS more than OCT, and if you use IVUS, what makes you use IVUS for instant restenosis rather than OCT? Uh, yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. Uh, for us, it's mainly really a, an economic choice. Um, for, for instant restenosis, if we think there's stent fracture, or if we think, uh, and in all cases of stent thrombosis, we tend to use OCT uh, because that gives you more more uh, salient information. For garden variety uh, instant restenosis, we tend to use IVUS. So OCD for stent thrombosis, once you clear the clot, because you want to understand what exactly happened, and any any suspicion of stent fracture, we again favor OCT. 
Um, uh, there's quite a differential in cost for us here in New Zealand. It's socialized medicine, so uh, we're very conscious of the dollar. Right. The, the depth of calcification, you know, the, the, new, the, the algorithm for calcification, which... The 555. Five. Correct, the 555. Five, five. That's only possible in OCT. I, I just correct. wanted to... And, and, and so here's my question to you, Sai. How... Hmm. It's fine to put the 555 together as an algorithm, uh, but the depth of calcification is only possible at OCT. Is it that important, or, or can you make decisions without that, and can you just make decisions on IVUS? Uh, and I just want to bring that out, because again, it becomes a question of cost and modalities. You could make decisions on IVUS. Whether they're co the correct decisions or not, you will know after you wrote the blade it. Um, when, when we have very challenging cases uh, and we IVUS them and we're not sure whether we use intravascular lithotripsy or, or, or ablation, we sometimes do use OCT to just guide us one way or the other. So I guess that's one, one subset where it might sway you, um, uh, whether it's a nodular type of calcification, I'm going to go with rotational atherectomy um, uh, as opposed to intravascular lithotripsy. Um, but this is based on intravascular lithotripsy being available for us for the last perhaps just over a year in New Zealand. So we'll learn more, I guess, uh, whether one modality is better than the other in defining how you modify your plaque uh, uh, based on the imaging. Yeah, because we've, we've uh, all the time for, for ages used for, for greater than 270 degrees, 270 degrees plus, we've used rotational atherectomy as a decision making. Now right. you add five, five millimeter depth, and that's for IVL purposefully. I, th I thought that uh, modality, that that algorithm, was looking for a use of OCT in calcification or displacing IVUS for calcification, uh, and that's the reason why it was put in. Uh, do you really is there a data for it? Uh, yeah, that's my question to you. I mean, I'm quite yeah, happy to use um, IVUS for that. Great question, uh, Ashok. The fact is that it is very, and Chiang can speak to this, it's very difficult to make an algorithm by IVIS because you don't have depth. And so we have tried, we actually presented our first data set on that uh, at TCT, but it's exquisitely complex. Um, you know, when you only have two parameters to look at uh, for, for stent expansion because you can't measure depth, um, you start turning into a multiple scoring system with uh, arc um, and length, which becomes voluminous and complex and very unlikely to be used clinically. Uh, and I think that th the depth is the most advantageous for one simple reason, that if you look not only at our data, but Professor Akasaka's data, the hazard ratio for the depth far outweighs length and arc. And that's an, a third study also showed that. Carlo DiMario's group showed that. So probably the depth, and this makes sense. It makes sense because we, our group has shown that if your calcium is less than half a millimeter thick, it's very easy to fracture with a balloon. But if it's one millimeter thick, you may not be able to fracture it with a high-pressure balloon, a non-compliant balloon, or in some cases, even atherectomy. Um, so I would say out of all of those, if you were only to give me one parameter, I would like to know the, our, the thickness. That's, that's a great. I mean, I think we should end this session on that note. I thought that was a great comment, and I think it clarifies a lot on that. for calcium, and I think it's very clear that OCT will have an added value in uh, assessing, the, assessing the thickness, which is the most important of all in assessing calcified lesions. So I yeah. think uh, we will uh, have a final comment from Dr. Seth, and we can yeah, I, I, just want to, I just want to thank everyone here. I think this was one of the most amazing faculties one can actually get together from the, across the world, and I think it represents truly the thought leadership of Asia-Pacific region. Every person you see across, and I, I must take this photograph, actually represents the thought leaders, international thought leaders of Asia Pacific <laughs> region. And of course, with us, we have Z, who we may also consider as a part of Asia Pacific. Z, uh, <laughs> at least, at least by your lineage, not by your birth, but at least by your lineage, and therefore.
I think this was a great session and a great start for an APSIC webcast. I think we should continue this. This will be the greatest learning process for the, for the, for the attendees of the Asia Pacific region and the combination of East meets the West will always actually flourish in greater, greater science and greater understanding of newer technologies. So with these words, thank you guys. Uh, this is a great photograph for the greatest brains of Asia Pacific region. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.